Hello, this is Alpha Bunga Bunga, the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history. Today we're very happy to be talking to Eric Blanc, who was a public high school teacher for eight years and more recently reported on the teacher strikes for in the United States for Jacobin and the nation. We're going to hear from Eric in just a second, but it's really interesting reading Eric's book. I mean, it's notable that the U.S. saw the highest number of workers on strike in 2018 than at any point since the 1980s, which sounds great, but it's also building from an extremely low base if we compare it to past decades. So uh, I had just looked up the figures before calling up Eric uh, just now, and 2018 saw nearly 500,000 workers on strike over the year. The last time this was beaten was in 1986, when 530,000 went on strike. But then if you go a little bit further back and compare this to the three decades after the Second World War, there were regularly one to two million people on strike. So it's very good to see this recent spike, but it is from a very low base, and we're going to explore a little bit more of the kind of recent past and uh, what exactly happened in 2018. The 2018 spike, as you probably imagine, was driven in large part by three major public sector strikes, teachers and support staff striking West Virginia, Oklahoma, and Arizona, as well as workers at Marriott hotels. So maybe that's an interesting contrast we might even discuss uh, in terms of public versus private sector workers. Eric's, Eric Blanc's book, Red State Revolt, uh, which is recently out, uh, catalogs these strike actions, but I think it also does a lot more than just cataloging because it makes lots of important points along the way, such as about the political aspects of strike action and the need to win over public opinion, about the role of relative rather than absolute deprivation in, in stimulating militancy, and also encountering a narrative found amongst the liberal press, especially that Trump land is just full of proto-fascists and is no place for socialists. Um, and so we're going to try to also uh, combat the narrative, and as we often try to do anyway on this podcast. So welcome, Eric. Really happy to have you. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Great. Uh, so to get started, we're actually going to go to the past. Red state, right? Red state has a bit of a double meaning. Obviously, it's red in, in American political terms, uh, meaning the GOP or conservative states, but also perhaps red in, in a more traditional sense, that, that of being socialist. So maybe you could start off by talking a little bit about the radical past of, of West Virginia and, and Oklahoma in particular, uh, those two states having a radical past, which often seems uh, forgotten in, in the kind of post-Cold War period. Yeah, I think it's good to start with that past because the impression you might get from just watching the mainstream news is that places like West Virginia or Oklahoma are intrinsically conservative and that presumably this goes back, you know, for all time. Mm. And in reality, you know, West Virginia and Oklahoma, at least 100 years ago, were bastions of labor militancy. The, the strongest socialist party um, in the United States was Oklahoma. This is the place where they got regularly 30, 40 percent of the votes in towns, elected just a, dozens of counselors, had a mass farmers socialist movement. Uh, and West Virginia, as some of your listeners might be aware, had really some of the most bloody and uh, massive armed uprisings of workers against not just employers, but the state, the mine war battles. Uh, in the early part of the 20th century were semi-insurrections of uh, mine workers against the employers and uh, eventually the U.S. federal government. So in, in both of these states, there was a very long and deep history of labor militancy, of socialism, and to greater or lesser extents, those traditions were cut off. In Oklahoma, the, the breach is deepest. You know, today, very few people, even in Oklahoma, are aware of that past. Um, it's not part of the living tradition at all. Even some of the socialists I met weren't aware of it until they got involved and started doing study groups on the history of Oklahoma. And, and there's more. And there's more of a connection in West Virginia than in Oklahoma. You think that there's a little yeah, bit more memory. Yeah, but in West Virginia, in West Virginia, um, there's more of a continuity. Not so much with the socialist um, aspects of the 
history, even though the people that led these insurrections and armed strikes were, for the most part, socialists and anarchists, that, that aspect got a little bit lost. But the militancy and the labor radicalism did live on, um, particularly in the southern counties of West Virginia, where uh, mines are more part of the political economy. And, you know, for people there, some of them I talked to traced their, you know, political upbringing to their great grandparents who participated in the mine wars and their grandparents who were mine workers and their mother or father who might have been actually a teacher um, who participated in the 1990 strike. So there was definitely like this heritage of labor activism uh, in at least a few of the counties that helps explain why, in particular, West Virginia was the state that really sparked this current uprising of educators. Right, and even symbolically, their use of like red bandanas and things like that obviously recalls that that recent past, or that recent past that that for that not not that recent past at all, but uh, that that past of uh, of the mine worker strikes and of the red the original rednecks. Yeah, and I think you know it's interesting. The there was somewhat of a, a simple and simplistic explanation then that was oh presumably people in West Virginia are just really into strikes and are militant, but the the, the situation was a little more complicated because they had to, in some ways, reimagine and, and bring back this history because for decades, uh, West Virginia, like the rest of the United States, has had a real marked decline in the labor movement. There haven't been a ton of strikes and people have been very demoralized and powerless. So it's not really the case that everyone was just raring to go because, you know, their parents were coal miners. The, the strikes, if anything, uh, breathe you know, fresh blood into a tradition that was dying down. And so it's just worth thinking about that then uh, and not assuming that tradition automatically leads to militancy. So, uh, hi, Eric, this is Phil. So on that then, um, can you give us a rundown of what happened and when and maybe what the uh, immediate context and background was for the for the strikes? Sure. The, the short version is that the current strike wave began in early 2018, February, March, in West Virginia. There was a massive strike that was illegal, that captured the imagination of people across the country, in part because it ended up going wildcat, which is to say that the you know the leadership of the union tried to call off the strike halfway through. The ranks ignored it and went on to win. And that process really kind of inspired educator, educators across the country to do similar actions. So then it spread to... Um, Oklahoma had a statewide walkout, then Arizona. There was multi-day walkouts that year in West, um, in North Carolina, in Kentucky, in Colorado. And then just this last year, 2019, we've already seen massive strikes of educators in Los Angeles, in Oakland, in Denver, and a few other places. So those are the you know big strikes that have marked this upsurge. And for the most part, the strikes have won, which is one of the reasons why they keep on spreading. Uh, you know, our side has been losing for a lo- very long time, and these strikes seem to indicate and continue to indicate that by withholding our labor, including in the public sector, we're able to win. So, you know, that we've seen massive pay increases, wins in more funding for students, beating back some of the worst attacks on unions and privatization efforts uh, across the board. And that uh, was the real, you know, meat of the upsurge and the strikes themselves took place in a context of decades of neoliberalism, like is the case in most of the world, but in particular since the Great Recession in 2007-2008, public education has just taken a beating, both by Republicans and Democrats. So there's been massive budget cuts, uh, privatization in particular has gotten pushed very dramatically. So, the, so could you just, could you maybe tell us, could you yeah. maybe... Um, so maybe explain a little more about what privatization means um, in terms of public education in the U.S. And also, if you could maybe just draw a kind of um, a picture for us, a demographic profile of what the um, of what a teacher in the U.S. Um, or in the strike hit states uh, would be like in terms of their wage, in terms of their standard of living, and what it what confronted them that they that necessitated them to. Um, engage in this labor militancy. If you could just draw a picture for us, basically, for our listeners. Yeah, so first on the privatization piece, the the playbook 
in most of the country, like in a lot of other countries, is that you starve public services, and then when it comes to education, the uh, presumed solution, according to basically the Democrats and the Republicans, is to bring in the private sector, which is to say what we call charter schools. So these are publicly funded but privately run schools, some of which are for profit. Um, and in the process, labor unions, for the most part, are uh, decimated because it's very hard to organize these charter schools and, and unions aren't given jurisdiction over them. And you see a real dramatic increase in inequality between funding and between uh, you know working class and non-working class neighborhoods based on who can get into these schools. So the charters has been really uh, at the center of the education policy for mm, years now, together with a, a really draconian push towards testing and accountability, quote unquote, of teachers that has made just teaching about uh, primarily pushing students to learn how to take tests and holding teachers supposedly accountable on how these students do on standardized testing rather than, for instance, building their critical thinking skills. So part of the context then for these strikes is, you know, teachers have been uh, proletarianized by the imposition of a real authoritarian work culture um, across the board in the United States. The type of autonomy that teachers used to have as professionals has really been um, decimated and together with uh, the living standards that you know may have led teachers in the past to have considered themselves part of the middle class. Today, that's far less frequent. And that's the reason why people are turning to unions and to strikes because just frankly, it seems like it's the only mechanism available for them to do their jobs. And you know, one of the common refrains then of teachers when you would ask them, you know, why are you on strike? Part of it was the wages, certainly. But a lot of it was that teachers, by the nature of the profession, generally get into it not because they think they're going to strike it rich, but you know, they have some sort of calling for them. They want to teach kids. They want to uh, make a difference. And just the context of cuts in particular and this uh, push towards testing has made it that they feel like they just can't do a decent job at their profession. And so that, yeah. ironically, the push towards wanting to be treated as professionals um, led them to working class forms of organization and action uh, yeah. because it seemed like the only ability to make those changes. How much did that figure in the... Um so this idea that they were in cape that it was the pressure they weren't able to do their jobs and that was part of the motivation for the strike action um how much did that figure in the public discussions of the strike in the slogans or in the justifications or in the debates around it well it was a huge part and you know and it overlaps with pay uh in a really um immediate sense because one of the aspects of them uh, not being able to do their job was just simply that they couldn't afford to live in some of these states anymore. Um, and so there was definitely a reality that teachers were quitting uh, either to leave the state or just to leave the profession. There's a massive teacher shortage across the board in the United States, both because of the pay issues and the underfunding, and then also because uh, of this uh, testing regime that you know most students and teachers find just incredibly objectionable. So, yeah, I think part of the reason the strikes were so successful, to be honest, was that it was clear uh, to the public as a whole that these were strikes not primarily around pay, or at least not exclusively around pay, but were really strikes on behalf of students as well and the parents uh, of these students, whether it was a question of raising more funds for the students or just really providing a decent public education in its you know various forms that that requires. Um, the strikes successfully beat back the main attack against unions, uh, you know, as far as the public narrative goes, which is that unions are just greedy, another, um, you know, special interest group fighting for themselves. And it was very hard to make that case in a place like L.A. or Oklahoma, in which teachers went on strike and literally were not raising demands for pay. They'd already won pay uh, increases on the eve of their strike. They were fighting for more funding for their students, for lower class sizes. So it made it very hard for the politicians to demonize them in that context. Do you think, um, do you think they enjoyed greater sympathy by virtue of being um, 
more middle class, more professionals. Um, I don't mean sympathy perhaps from the public, but perhaps sympathy from the media and also made it more difficult for um, their opponents, politicians to demonize them as well. Well, it, 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 that's a tricky thing to answer because for years in the United States, um, the public sector and public sector workers, as well as teachers, have been demonized. So there's not any sort of intrinsic sympathy from yeah. the media class or the powers that be towards um, teachers in particular. We've seen really across the board um, a discourse blaming teachers for uh, inequitable conditions, really blaming a lot and putting a lot of um, culpability on uh, supposedly lazy or greedy teachers. So that changed um, mostly because of the strikes. The strikes themselves and the demands uh, change the public narrative. They change the common sense. And I do think um, part of that is because teachers are well respected in their communities. So this is less an issue of you know the sympathies of the media class, although may maybe that plays a part. But for the most part, teachers, despite these uh, you know being scapegoated, they they just know a huge amount of people in the neighborhoods and cities where they live. And that kind of organic connection to the rest of the working class, um, you know, really provided the leverage that they tapped into in making the strike successful. It, it didn't automatically lead to um, support from the public as a whole. There's been a lot of teacher strikes in the past in, the, in this country that have failed because, uh, you know, it's very hard if you go out on strike and students have nowhere to go, it's very easy for the public to turn against you. But in this yeah. case, the uh, reality was that they were able to lean off their you know, authority and legitimacy in the community uh, to make it clear that they were striking uh, really as a last resort and they deserved the you know, support of parents. So how, so they won, you'd say they won the support of students and parents? Oh yeah, overwhelmingly. This is, uh, you know, at this point, really not even a subject of debate. The polls, you know, for better or for worse, uh, you know, as far as how much we want to place stock in those, had the support nationally for the teacher strikes at about 78%, which is just, you know, astronomically high. And in a place like Oklahoma or Arizona, which are, you know, supposedly deep red states in which union density is something like 4%, the teacher strikes had 73 74 percent of the public according to the polls backing them and it's one of the reasons why you know most of the politicians ended up capitulating because the longer the strikes went uh, the more support the teachers were getting so, so how do you how do you explain yeah. that then beyond so you made you made a good point about the um uh place of teachers in the community and the variety of people that they know by virtue of their job but how would you, I mean, is that sufficient to explain that remarkable degree of popular support then in as much as it's measured by the polls? Well, uh, it's not uh, on its own the, the only factor. Part of it has to be just the context, which is to say that people really understand just based off of their experience that schools have been getting just pummeled for uh, the past years, you know, particularly since the recession. It's not hard to be sympathetic to teachers when you know that your students are in classrooms that have books that are completely out of date, that have broken classroom uh, chairs in which uh, class sizes are like 40 or up. Just the, the, the real crisis in public schools in the United States across the board has made it such that uh, there really is a lot of anger. And I think that that sentiment then was sufficient that when teachers raised these questions, uh, it was not a hard case to make to the public that they were in the right. You know, and, and another aspect, and I, this is, it's interesting worth thinking through, you know, why at this point are the strikes so popular? Part of it is just the general mood in the United States right now, um, which is different than maybe it was in the past. It might be different than other countries. I'm not sure. Um, but there is a generalized anger at rich people and at austerity that we haven't seen the likes of in a very long time. So when people were fighting back and saying the reason we don't have good schools is because the billionaires and corporations aren't paying their fair share, that resonated. And you know, people are angry and I think are very open to that message right now. So the context of you know the Bernie Sanders campaign, the rebirth of socialism, things that we can talk about a little bit more, uh, are reflections of a very deep 
uh, anger right now at the status quo. And the teacher's strikes kind of gave voice to that in a way that um, I think explains part of the reason they were so popular. Yeah, and not just give voice to, but I think give substance to, because it's very easy to, I guess, to sometimes be talking about a lot of public anger, but when it isn't represented in, 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 in any sort of engaged, energized, and militant social base, it just, you know, it can evaporate very quickly. It can seem to be a bit of a, almost a mediatized phenomenon. So this kind of really, uh, I guess, would give lie to the idea that the degree of public anger isn't just a floating thing, isn't just a, a sort of a, a passing thing, but is actually genuine. I wanted to ask a little bit more about these the states in which uh, the, the main strikes took place, because, I mean, especially for listeners who aren't in the U.S., uh, who might not be really familiar with the sort of landscape of these states. Uh, so if you could maybe paint us a little bit of a picture in terms of um, wh- what the composition of these states are in terms of, especially in terms of labor, um, what their, what the politics of these states are, uh, the kind of degree of, you know, what the relative income is of these states versus others, uh, inequality in these states, uh, and, and even perhaps reflect on, on what the, the, the kind of forms of, of politics that there are in these states. Because, I mean, looking from the outside, we t- like, I think we kind of tend to think, oh, the United States is all the same and that states don't really have that much different between one between the other, um, when actually that might not be the case. So it'd be interesting to hear a little bit more about uh, how these states might be dr- different from one another. Right. Well, the the most immediate thing to highlight is that these uh, places where the strikes in 2018 at least popped off, so we're talking about West Virginia, Arizona, Oklahoma, uh, were quote-unquote red states. So, you know, we we mentioned that a little bit, but specifically this means that they are uh, states that overwhelmingly voted for Trump in the 2016 election in which Republicans have a firm hold over uh, not just the governorship, but of over the legislature, and which, at least in the popular imagination as portrayed in the mainstream media, these are presumably deeply conservative states. And so the strikes in, in some ways punctured that myth, but there, there is something to be said that this is not where you would expected, uh, would have expected there to be a strike wave emanating from, because labor unions are very weak. These are right-to-work states, which means in the context of the United States, that uh, it's very hard for unions to uh, grow and to collect uh, dues from members uh, for legal restrictions. Public sector strikes in each one of these states are illegal. That's actually, uh, you know, the norm in most states. Mm. But well, definitely... actually, maybe you could tell us a little bit more exactly about uh, what right-to-work laws look like and really how heavy is the boot on the neck of labor in the United States and how does that vary kind of state to state? I mean, you know, we talk about red states and blue states and i guess i wanted to ask you know how actually cons- not, not in cultural terms but how you know socially and politically conservative are these states and to what extent is uh the politics and the law actually holding down any sort of uh you know manifestation of, of labor militancy yes well i mean across the board uh in the united states and the country as a whole labor law is extremely restrictive uh, even in places like where i live new york there's not a you know public sector workers don't have the right to strike but in particular for these uh three states the the thing i would highlight as uh one of the major legal restrictions that really shaped the whole contours of the strikes as they played out was there's no collective bargaining um so there's very little in the way of legal infrastructure through which unions might be able to make some sort of demands through institutional channels. So you have unions that aren't recognized by the state and uh, therefore, for the most part, have resorted to, for years, lobbying um, the Democratic Party and and legislatures uh, and acting almost as uh, special interest lobby groups that have some funds from uh, people who workers who opt in to uh, join the unions. Many people join the unions in these states for like insurance reasons, which is to say that you'll be a member of the union because if you have some discipline problem with your principal or administrator, the union might be able to get you a lawyer. But there's not a tradition of strikes or collective bargaining. And really there's somewhat of a political and organizational vacuum in Arizona, West Virginia, Oklahoma. 
And that explains in some ways why the strikes that arose were so tumultuous because there was very little in the way of like a strong labor bureaucracy or officialdom. And there was very little in the mechanisms through which anybody could even conceive of forcing the politicians to listen to them uh, short of withholding their labor, you know, just because there was no other avenues available. And the unions in all, in the unions just were saying in all of these states were very weak. Um, you know, in a place like Arizona, the union density, as mentioned, was about four or five percent. In education, which uh, in every state of the United States, teachers unions are the strongest. In Arizona, 25 percent of educators were members of the union. Oklahoma, 40 percent. And that they were able to get to majoritarian strikes despite that uh, was pretty remarkable. So paradoxically, I mean, maybe this is pushing it a bit, but paradoxically, the success of the strike was due to the... Um withered state then of the union infrastructure yeah there's something to that um at least there's something to the argument that the reason the strikes were able to spread uh, and emerge and become statewide um despite the legal restrictions was the relative weakness of the unions and that that's a double-edged sword because it's meant yeah. that in the you know in the wake of the strikes they didn't have the uh, same continuity in organization and in yeah. power that could lead them to sustain. So there was somewhat of an explosive volcanic nature, um, which has its pluses and negatives. But there, it's certainly the case that um, the union leadership didn't have the same ability to be able to prevent these uh, as they might in a place like California or New York, in which there is collective bargaining, in which they can sort of lean on their connections and the institutional arrangements to dampen uh, and prevent this type of sort of volcanic labor militancy from below. The it's unions really, had to get pushed, you know, the unions had to get pushed from below in each one of the states. It's really intriguing and also um, and also striking, I guess, the fact that the that the powers that be, the state and the elite, have um, that the channels for communication from society are so degraded or blocked off. Um, that it ends up backfiring against, that it ends up, you know, kind of um, working against them effectively. Yeah, and, and I think in some ways these states uh, reflect tendencies that are really common in the United States as a whole and, and explains the kind of bizarre and exciting moment we're in right now in which just the traditional infrastructures of, like, civil society have become so hollowed out that um, it's both created space for um, things like, you know, these mass strikes or the um, reemergence of a socialist movement, um, but also made them difficult because there isn't this recent tradition of organization that people can lean on. And so uh, it's a very, um, it's a very difficult situation to wrap one's head around because the Democratic Party, for instance, or the traditional unions don't have the same sort of on the ground reach that they used to. Um, and that has created space for us to be able to organize. But it also means that, you know, it's quite difficult to get people back into the mindset of collective organizing, collective decision making, um, and not just relying on sort of these flash mob mobilizations. Yeah, absolutely. I And it's kind of, this makes me think uh, specifically in relation to um, public sector strikes, because the situation would be a little bit different were it in the private sector. Uh, because these are public sector strikes, there is a political, an, an immediately political angle to it, which you've already illustrated in the ways in which uh, they were able to appeal for more funding, for example, and not just be economistic in the sense of fighting for higher wages. So in some senses, that makes it, that gives it a, a, an easier um, kind of point of contact um, to, for, to, to mobilize these strikes. But at the same time, um, it's I guess the question would be then is how generalizable is this experience? And, and you know your, your book illustrates nicely how you know they were they were able to, for example, to actually mount protests and have big turnout of protests at the state capitol um, to supplement the strike. So it wasn't just a walkout, but they were actually able to um, uh, exert po you know political pressure uh, and and so to therefore play the, the the game of public opinion, which was really crucial to this. I guess my question then is, is how generalizable is this lesson to, uh, firstly, to other public sector workers where their social contribution, I guess, is less marketable, is less valorized in society. So, 
sure, everyone likes teachers or everyone recognizes the role that teachers play in social reproduction, in bringing up children, in educating children, but what if they were transport workers or office workers of some other type in, uh, you know, the state bureaucracy? That becomes a little bit more difficult to win that public opinion battle. Uh, and then you have the other uh, question, which is that, you know, the right often likes to play the private sector against the public sector. I mean, certainly in places where the public sector has able, been able to achieve more leverage and are able to achieve higher wages uh, when compared to the private sector, that, you know, the right likes to say that, oh, you know, the public sector is all well off and the private sector workers are downtrodden and the public sector shouldn't go on strike. So, I mean, how do you negotiate that and how, how can you imagine this strike wave being taken forward uh, into other sectors which uh, don't, which aren't able to rely on the fact of being able to say, listen, we're, we're educating our children. This is our uh, social, ob you know, very obvious social contribution. Yeah, that's a really good question. It's a tough question because, you know, this isn't just a U.S. dynamic in which strikes are disproportionately in the public sector. And, the, you know, the big $64,000 question, I think, for socialists across the board internationally is how do we ultimately rebuild a fighting labor movement in the private sector, which continues to, you know, be the main uh, source of employment for most workers. That being said, I don't think it's the case that only teachers have this ability to um, tap public opinion and leverage that against the state, although it's probably easier um, for educators because of those organic links that we mentioned. But to, just to give the example that you mentioned, a uh, question of public transport workers. Well, public transport workers, first of all, uh, have a huge amount of political leverage because if you don't, um, you know, if you don't go to work and the subways aren't running, uh, it's very hard for a city to function. So you can force the state uh, to listen because of that. But again, it raises this question of, was well, the public going to be with you? And I, I do think we've had some experience of that in New York. Um, and the obligation then, I think, in places where you might not uh, as immediately have this support, but it's worth saying even, even amongst educators, they didn't automatically have this support, as we mentioned before, is you really probably do have to foreground demands on behalf of working people as a whole. So to take the public transport workers, well, if, if transport workers just go out on strike uh, to... Uh, for better wages, for instance, it's it's very conceivable you could imagine the public turning out on them after a day or two. But what if, and this has happened in a lot of cases, what if the transport workers go out not just for better wages, but for lower fees, right? Lower, um, you know, lower prices for the public at, as a whole, or they call for expanding the, um, you know, the services uh, in a way that can kind of capture the public support. And I think really part of the reason then you... Um, had successes in the past and other public sector strikes or in the private sector as a whole is that unions did a much better job, uh, as I mentioned before, of fighting not just for themselves, but for the working class as a whole. And particularly at this moment in which uh, the leverage of labor and labor traditions are so much weaker, it's important, I think, to highlight that aspect of it, um, particularly for people like transport workers or others who might not automatically have either the social weight or the political support. Um, that teachers can lean on. So I do think it's ultimately generalizable, uh, the strike wave, but there are more, I think, structural constraints that will require like deeper organizing and then also probably more conscious efforts to win over the public uh, than even we saw in the education strikes. Well, yeah, and I think one thing that you illustrate in your book, which is really positive, is, and now you'll have to remind me in which state this was, because I believe it was just in one of them, that there was a walkout of all staff, all support staff in schools, and not just uh, teachers, which is why they, they referred to the, the strike as an educator's strike rather than just teachers. And that was quite positive, that they were able to also get the, the buy-in from, uh, well, from more traditionally proletarian uh, workers in terms of... Uh, you know, school dinner ladies and uh, and bus drivers and things like that. Yeah, so that was in West Virginia, but also to a certain extent in Arizona. The uh, success of the strike, as you mentioned, was contingent on this being a uh, real industrial strike, which in you know in the U.S. context means basically all workers in a given enterprise, as opposed to a sectoral, just teachers' strike. 
And in West Virginia, the bus drivers in particular played this totally disproportionate role in the success of the strike and then in the uh, emergence of the Wildcat strike. Because uh, for the context of West Virginia in particular, which uh, your listeners might not know, is a very uh, mountainous and rural state, students depend on the buses to get to school and back. Uh, there's basically no public transportation. And, uh, you know, there's this means that there's a huge amount of power for these bus drivers. Because what ended up happening was on the eve of the strike, bus drivers said, well, we don't know if the rest of the teachers are ready to go out, but we can tell you we are not coming to work. Uh, and if we don't come to work, the schools will not open. And that happened again when the strike uh, went ended up going wildcat halfway through. Bus drivers said, we're not coming. And that really ended up proving to be a turning point because had it just been teachers alone, uh, the public uh, employers, the state, very well may have been able to open up the schools uh, and break the strike. So it did require this sort of cross-sectoral uh, organizing that posed the question really of the worth and legitimacy of all workers, including cafeteria workers, bus drivers, and not just the more professional teachers. So... Um... I suppose to just to broaden out the picture a bit then to the political context of um, of the strike action, um, you've already talked a bit about the state level uh, connections between unions and the kind of the withered character of um, union and labor organization in some of these states and how that affected the dynamic of the strike. But I guess uh, just to ask then if there's any kind of a relationship between uh, the character or frequency of strike action and the incumbent of the White House, um, or indeed the political um, who's in charge at the political level in the state. Um, does it would it have changed? Do you think if there had been um, demo, either a Democrat in the White House or uh, Democratic control within the states where the strikes happened? Yeah, that's a good question. The the national political dynamics uh, were important, but maybe in a more indirect way. You know, the first thing to say is that the real first big impetus nationally for this came not through Trump, but actually through Bernie Sanders. Uh, a lot of the core organizers that first initiated the strikes in West Virginia and Arizona in particular were very young teachers who had organized together for the first time through the Bernie Sanders campaign, which legitimized class politics in these states on a popular way for the first time in a very long time. So the Bernie campaign uh, played this big kind of instigator role. And then the Trump um, the Trump emergence had this dynamic where it further radicalized some of these uh, young socialists, to be honest, to get organized. And that played out in their instigator role. But it's not the case that I think the national political emergence of Trump was the defining, uh, you know, impetus, because in some ways the real uh, meat of state, uh, of public education policy in uh, our country. Well, no, but, but I didn't, I mean, I, I didn't mean to suggest that um, Trump was an instigator for, or a trigger for the strikes, but rather um, was, say, if it was Hillary in the White House, would there be less, would uh the strikers have felt less willing to go on strike, perhaps, or would the strike have spread, would not have spread as quickly, or perhaps um, cultivated less sympathy from uh, the liberal left? Or, I mean, just to yeah. get a sense of what the, if there's a political seesaw effect, but dependent on the uh, who's in government. Yeah. Well, the first thing to say is that a public education policy uh, in our country is overwhelmingly a state level issue. So, I think some of the dynamic that you're reflecting there was true. That is less is less the fact that Trump was in the presidency and more that Republicans were um, in charge of these states. And what that meant was, for instance, some of the media coverage ended up becoming a little bit more positive uh, because these were seen as strikes initially that were against Republicans. And so the narrative in the first part of the strike wave in particular, when these were just you know, quote unquote, red state strikes was somewhat sympathetic by, you know, the corporate liberal establishment because it was seen as, well, maybe this might help us 
uh, win in the November elections, the midterms, right? Because these are educators turning against Republicans. And similarly, uh, part of the reason that the traditional labor unions in these states uh, ended up getting on board, why the teachers unions ended up under pressure siding with these rank and file uh, groups that push towards a strike, part of that was because they didn't have to confront the Democrats on a statewide level, right? That they could maintain their allegiance to the Democratic Party and still end up going along with these walkouts. And they definitely framed it in that context that, you know, we're, these are the bad Republicans pushing the policies. That, that narrative, though, of um, the, you know, this is a strike wave against Republicans, it was always very limited because in some ways, the first strike that initiated this type of teacher militancy began in 2012 with the Chicago teacher strike, uh, in, which was a direct confrontation with the Democrats in Chicago. And since uh, just this year, we've seen the strike spread to California, in which the teachers unions have had to directly confront the Democrats. And in places, therefore, where the Democrats are in charge, um, at least amongst educators, if not the broader public, there has been a very deep disillusionment because for the most part, Democrats have done identical policies of austerity and privatization. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, the uh, charter schools thing is a bipartisan policy consensus across the nation, isn't it? Yeah, it's actually gone further um, in blue states and under Democratic uh, rule than it has under Republicans. You had far yeah. more charters pushed under the Obama administration than before or since. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, as far as educators, it's definitely a bipartisan uh, offensive. And that I that I think is connected to the um, to the very neoliberal character of uh, charter schools, um, and the fact that a particular kind of of a left neoliberalism I think model that they fit. But we'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, I just to just before I hand it back to Alex, um, there was just one thing is just to would it be fair to say that most I mean so it's an interesting dynamic you just drew there. But would it be fair to say that most teachers could it would across the country as a whole. Would most of them vote Democrat? Would that be a fair assumption? Um, well, or would it be more I, I evenly tell, split? Can, yeah, it's more evenly split. I can tell you at least for these red states, because I, I did a lot of uh, interviews and, and looked into the data, uh, the voting record of most of the strikers was about evenly split between uh, Republicans and Democrats with about yeah, it's, 40, it's really interesting. 40, 40, and then a, a sizable number of independents. So, yeah, it was definitely not the case that teachers or uh, educators generally were deep blue, uh, at least not in these red states. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I wanted to ask uh, a last question, I guess, about, uh, about unionism before moving on to talking a little bit about the marketization of education, as Phil already sort of foreshadowed. Uh, you write in the book, uh, you make reference to something called social justice unionism. And uh, you reference it in, in, rel in reference to a trend within unions, within American labor unions, of trying to go beyond the limited business unionism of the past towards building unity in the community. But this has tended towards working with nonprofits, often towards electoral initiatives, and has gone hand in hand with a, a decline in actual militancy. Uh, they've abandoned strikes as an actual weapon. So you then suggest that this model could sort of be developed upon and combined with an increased militancy could develop a sort of social justice unionism that goes beyond what has existed uh, up until recently. So what is this new model that you think could emerge? Yeah, so the experience we've had is that even traditional labor unions now uh, at least are willing to make rhetorical gestures to um, social justice issues. And in some ways, it's provided a cover for them to not do the type of deep organizing or confrontational politics uh, that, you know, historically the labor movement has done. And so it's been problematic. The synthesis, if you want to think it that way, of these recent strikes was that it showed, on the one hand, as we mentioned before, that it, it is important to raise demands uh, of a broader nature, whether it's, uh, you know, broader funding for students or social justice concerns like anti-racism, and that this did prove to be a, you know important lever to win public support. But if that is done as a substitute and for uh, doing the workplace organizing around the immediate demands of educators themselves and in trying to instigate strikes in particular, uh, 
it's not likely to lead towards the type of power that's necessary. And so what we saw in the strikes that I thought was fascinating, really, was that this type of community support was brought about not because unions or union leaderships made alliances with the existing community groups, for the most part, although there was some of that, but happened more because of the organic links of rank and file teachers to the community meant that it was by organizing at the work site that you know, rank and filers were empowered to go out and talk to their parents and they were talked to their neighbors. And it was a ripple effect, therefore, through the ranks and outwards organically through the community that this sort of alliance was able to be built in the process of building towards a strike. And I think that's going to be the model and not this very up from high leadership between leader union and profit alliance, which hasn't really built much power. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, I wanted to move on now to, to talk a little bit more about the role of education in all this. Um, obviously, I think, as has been very widely discussed before, but I think the absurdity of, of neoliberalism is best seen in education. Uh, ideas like trying to increase efficiency, uh, the implementation of standardization, marketization, these are all so anathema to ed education. Uh, and it's so yet it, it's it's probably it, it grates most strongly uh, precisely in education because it's an area where I think a lot of people instinctively feel that they these these things just don't belong. Um, so to what extent did did educators did teachers on strike actually defend education? What was that defense of education like? They obviously you, you mentioned them uh, making demands for smaller class sizes for better funding. Was there a discussion uh, about the quality of education at all? Yeah, certainly. I mean, the it's hard to separate the funding question from the quality of education question because it's precisely because of the absence of, of course, uh, yeah. just enough money to provide decent services, to be able to keep good educators uh, in the schools, that it's that absence that has led to a real deterioration in school quality. Um, so that it was at the fore. I mean, e even just on the most basic level, if you can't keep good teachers because you can't pay them enough, the people who are going to hurt from that are students. And so one of the things that you saw a lot was students complaining uh, about the fact that every year they have new teachers who are inexperienced and who really don't have the ability to, you know, teach them what they need. And uh, students in particular came out in support of the walkouts because they had a sense that you know, this was going to be a way to support their teachers and have them be able to uh, really defend um, their students as well. As far as the more qualitative questions of the school, I think the biggest issue that came up was this question of testing. There was just a lot of signs and a lot of talk mm. about uh, the need to push back against this over-testing regime, which has just, you know, made teaching a chore which has made being a student just kind of unbearable and you know teachers and students both dislike this and it feels like uh, it's been imposed from above with no real clear reason you know it's not clear to students or teachers you know what is actually uh, this over testing regime uh, accomplishing you know what are we getting out of this and so I do think that um, one of the demands in Los Angeles um, but, you know, at least as part of the rhetoric elsewhere was reversing this corporate ed reform and bringing back the type of critical thinking, bringing back the arts, bringing back sports, things that have been cut for absence of funds, uh, you know, have really become now uh, an urgent necessity for, I think, re-engaging students with, uh, you know, the schools as a whole. Absolutely. I wanted to ask a little bit, because we were talking about charter schools a bit before, and of course one of the big issues in terms of uh, standardization and marketization in education is the decline in teacher autonomy. Do charter schools, because they're privately run, offer in any way more autonomy to teachers, or is it even worse there? No, it's definitely uh, worse uh, in most regards. So, you know, I, I've taught in both public and and charter schools, and the, you know, the mixed the mixed bag aspect is that some of the charter schools um, are able to frame themselves as socially justice oriented, 
and this is this irony of part of the neoliberal offensive is that it's in the name of social justice that some of this privatization has happened. Right. And it, it's true. Left, you know, and, left neoliberalism. Right. And, and it is true that in particular in the United States, in which it has a very long and sordid history of uh, segregated institutions generally in public education, has always been inferior for um, black and brown students. So, so there is this, you know, real limitation in the existing public school system, and the charters, uh, in large part, were able to frame themselves as alternatives to uh, parents of color uh, as a way of sort of addressing some of these inequities. The problem is that when it comes down to it, the level of autonomy uh, for teachers, for the most part, is way less in these charter schools. You have almost no um, job security, or actually basically none. So you're at fear of getting fired at any point, which is not true in the, um, you know, in the public sector in which you have some sort of checks and balances, uh, some sort of uh, rights that give you the ability to push back against administrators, give you maybe some confidence to try to bring in uh, material into your classroom that might be deemed controversial by administrators. There's almost no space for that in a lot of charter schools, um, you know, with, with a few exceptions. So I do think that um, that's one of the reasons why there is a push towards privatization is precisely because this very authoritarian, top-down, uh, really, work process is much easier to implement in a privately run school than it is in the public sector. That being said, I, I do think one of the exciting uh, dynamics of the recent strikes is that teachers unions at their best, and particularly in Los Angeles, have tried to take this uh, social justice concern about pedagogy, talking about, you know, talking about the real history of, um, you know, students of color, anti-racist struggles, and saying we do need our public schools to be able to do this as well. But in fact, it's going to be through a reinvigorated public school system that will be able to teach relevant materials, and it's not going to be through privatization. No, that's very interesting. I wanted to ask, you know, as I made reference to in the introduction, obviously labor militancy is at a historically low ebb, uh, 2018's recent spike notwithstanding, you know, and there's obviously some, as you've made reference to, a lot of public anger and that this is being uh, given voice to in these recent strikes. And that's really great. But it, it, it does seem, of course, that, you know, h workers are historically disorganized at this uh, moment in time. And there where they are organized are often uh, burdened with a, a sclerotic union bureaucracy. So, you know, this is a real difficulty that socialists have to confront in, in trying to organize today. Education does seem, for, for precisely the reasons that uh, we've just been talking about, in terms of resistance to, uh, well, you know, I guess what is called neoliberalism, but, you know, especially, you know, the implementation of standardization, efficiency, decline of teacher autonomy, and so on, does seem to provide a more fruitful site for organization in the more immediate term, precisely because it's able to, you know, st actually start up a discussion about these values in a more, um, in a more thoroughgoing and more political sense than uh, organizing in in other in other areas, especially in the private sector, where you know we already have uh, made reference to the difficulties of of organizing in those areas because of precaritization and, and other factors. Uh, so, do you see uh, the education sector as a real site for organization and middle militancy going forward? Yeah, I mean, it's not accidental that the teachers in the United States have been the first to have a strike wave in decades. And that, you know, in a lot of countries, this is similar. I think if we're looking forward uh, ahead, part of the responsibility then of teachers unions, if we want to generalize uh, this movement and to really rebuild the labor movement as a whole, is going to be pushing the envelope beyond just their sectoral concerns, which is to say that you can envision, and in fact, in some places it's happening, like California, labor unions, teachers unions that went on strike uh, for education, then spearheading fights for progressive taxation, for taxing the rich and the corporations to provide not just better schools, but better public services as a whole. So in California, the LA Teachers Union, which led a big strike, is now organizing a coalition across the whole state uh, to go after billions of dollars for more funding, not just for schools, but for healthcare, for public sector uh, services generally. And so if you can start to organize the public sector as a whole, that, in turn, I think, is going to have to be the leverage in which the labor movement can be rebuilt. 
And it's by having a strong public sector labor movement that is winning, is that winning good standards and which is fighting for working people as a whole. That on right. the one hand will be able to, I think, inspire private sector workers because if public sector workers keep on fighting and winning, uh, that can be a really tremendous boon for others to want to fight back. But I think it's also just to be real, it's going to have to be uh, building power to force changes in the governmental structure that can uh, make it easier for the working class as a whole to organize. So labor unions, even if they're in the public sector, have this responsibility, for instance, to push for labor law reform that can, uh, for instance, standardize the working conditions for all workers in a given city or state so that people in the gig economy uh, have the possibility to organize, right, so that people have the right to strike where currently they do not. And I think that in the same way that certain private sector industries were basically able to be the pivot of a lot of organizing in the 1920s or 30s, thinking about like auto or you know steel, um, there's no reason, I think, intrinsically to discount the possibility that teachers unions and the public sector revitalized can be the pivot through which we could reinvigorate mm. the private sector, particularly, and I think this is important, in the United States, I'm very hopeful about if we're able to push in the direction of a Green New Deal, a lot of these new jobs uh, can very uh, easily become union jobs. And these are jobs that can't be shipped abroad. Um, and that gives us a possibility then for in the private sector or in a very massively expanded public sector, you know, by the millions to be a bastion for more labor organizing for, you know, a much larger sector of the population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But I, so, but just to come back on that, Eric, um, couldn't it be the other way around? I mean, that the, the, it's consistent with a broader pattern of political radicalization, which is to say that the, um, the energy behind the Bernie campaign and the wider, um, the wider limited revival of left-wing politics, both in the U.S. and also wider afield, is fits the pattern of a squeezed middle class, uh, downwardly mobile um, professionals, um, public sector or middle class, uh, state-dependent middle classes, educated professionals, whose prospects and working conditions are less than their forebears would have had in the past, would have enjoyed in the past. So doesn't that set limits on how far the just the character of the job and the character of the groups that are under pressure sets limits on how far the radicalization can spread to other groups in society? Well, I can speak to the United States, I, uh, less so elsewhere. I, I don't think that's the case here. Um, just... For instance, if you look at the polls, it's actually the middle class uh, overall is quite hostile to the Bernie Sanders campaign, for instance, and most of his support um, has come from uh, really the lowest regions of the working class. The number one um, contributor to the Bernie campaign has come from workers at Walmart, right? Teachers are number two, but I do think that at this point in time, uh, teachers have ceased to be part of the middle class that become proletarianized. And this is a dynamic that, you know, really is not anomalous in labor history, which is to say that, you know, a lot of times it's precisely the more quote unquote privileged sectors of the um, working class, people that in the, you know, maybe uh, in years prior had been possibly middle class. I'm thinking about artisans. If you think about the role of artisans in leading the labor movement in the early part of the 20th century, it's a similar thing. They used to have autonomy consider themselves upwardly mobile, and then because of the process of proletarianization, ended up getting pushed into the working class, but because they had more social leverage, maybe more education and higher expectations, were able to be a fulcrum through broader organizing. So I do think that at least the anger um, amongst working people is clearly there. Um, it's not at all just the case that um, teachers are the only people who are angry. I think the difficulty is that most people still feel powerless and teachers, for the reasons we discussed, have a little bit more structural leverage at this point to go back and fight. And it's going to be by leaning on these workers who are already fighting, who have a little bit more structural leverage, that broader sectors of the working class hopefully uh, can get organized. There's nothing automatic about that process. And one of the reasons why I'm skeptical about structural explanations for the decline in the labor movement is just to be real, uh, I think for the most part, a lot of the left has abandoned organizing workers and for years has looked towards alternatives and social movements uh, and everything except for going and organizing workers uh -huh. at Absolutely. their workplace. Yeah. And so, yeah. 
so it's hard to say. It's very hard to test the limits of our current situation uh, until we can have what we used to, which is the common sense that our main strength for being able to beat back into the billionaires is by going to be radiating power outwards from uh, you know workplaces. And until we start trying that, I think it's very hard to discount the possibility for rebuilding a class movement as a whole. Absolutely. That's very well put. Testing the limits of our current situation. Uh, that is absolutely what's necessary. Really enjoyed talking to you, Eric. Uh, Eric's book is The Red State Revolt, The Teacher's Strike in Working Class Politics. It's out now. Uh, it's part of the Jacobin series at Verso. Eric, thanks very much for talking to us. That's been great. Yeah, thanks yeah, for thank having you, me on. Eric. That was fun.